Good afternoon, everyone. If we could just have a seat so we could get started with this afternoon's lecture. My name is Craig Nard. I'm the director of the Center for Law, Technology, and the Arts here at Case and a law professor here as well. It's uh, my pleasure to welcome you to the annual Distinguished IP Lecture sponsored by the Law School and the Center for Law, Technology, and the Arts. We're very pleased and honored to have John Whalen with us today for our Distinguished IP Lecture. As many of you know, John is now the solicitor of the Patent and Trademark Office. Uh, prior to that, he was acting solicitor. He spent some time uh, in practice with Fish and Neve and was also uh, in industry as an electrical engineer. John has argued numerous cases before the Federal Circuit, has briefed many others, and is also integrally related with the Solicitor General's office and works with the SG's office in getting the Supreme Court more engaged. And perhaps we'll hear a little bit of that this afternoon. Uh, John received his law degree from Harvard and is steeped in patent policy. And anyone who comes to case who's steeped in patent policy, I welcome with open arms. Please welcome John Whalen. Thank you. Do you guys need to turn this on? Because I've, I've turned it on, and it's, I don't see the light. It's working? OK. You guys can hear me? I thought I'd go for about, what, 40 minutes, 30, 40, 35 minutes, and then, and then leave it open for questions. Um, I'm used to using a clock, so sorry. At the court, they have red lights that go on. So. Um, I, um, what I'm going to do is tell you a little bit about what my office does, um, partly because it's a little self-promotion, but partly because I've done this a few times now, and I don't think most people know what we do. And I've heard, I think, objectively, that people are kind of interested when they walk out of the room and are a bit surprised to see the different things that my office does. I also try to put a face with uh, an agency that sometimes probably appears to you to be a big FedEx mail drop. And, um, and try to give a sense of uh, somebody you can contact if you have a, a problem, you know, not with an examiner, but, but have a real problem that you think I might be able to assist you with or at least get you the person that can assist you. Um, so I appreciate Craig inviting me out here. We were both clerks at the Federal Circuit, and that's how we got to kind of know each other. And it's kind of a, a, it's really a privilege, a kind of network of people that you stay in contact with. And uh, I really enjoy coming to cities like this. I mean, I've spoken in D.C. and New York, but... You know, when I come to a, I've been to Wisconsin and Milwaukee, and I've been to St. Louis, and you actually get to see uh, a number of people from all the firms that do the work you do, and um, you can't do that in most of the big cities. So I appreciate the invitation. I'm going to focus on two substantive things as I go through this, and Craig talked about one of them um, dealing with the recent um, Supreme Court cases dealing with patents, and tell you a little of the inside baseball that's been going on that I've learned. Uh, and the other thing I'm going to talk to you about um, is the two new rule packages uh, that issued um, at the beginning of the year. I typically don't deal with rule packages. I've never written a patent application in my life, uh, but these two are pretty big, limiting continuations and uh, using representative claims. And uh, for those of you that aren't, don't know about them, I think even someone like Craig was pretty interested when I started to explain to him what we're thinking of doing. Um, how many people here are do patent prosecution mostly? And how many litigate mostly? Okay. So you guys know about the rule packages, some of you. So I'll, I'll get to them in the second half. So that's what I plan on covering. I'll give you a little background in my office. Um, about six or seven years ago, when the AIPA passed, the, which was the biggest piece of patent legislation to pass in a number of years, uh, the American Intellectual Property Protection Act, I think it was called, whatever it was called. It uh, created a little different reorg for our office. Uh, there's a general counsel in my office now who's my boss, Jim Tupin. Um, my office uh, of about 15 lawyers and 10 support staff runs all the IP intellectual property litigation. Uh, I have a, there's a sister office of mine that does all the non-IP issues. And when you're an agency at $1.5 billion with 7,000 employees, you'd be surprised how many non-IP issues there are, labor, money, um, you name it, we deal with it. Um, we get sued for lots of reasons. And Bernie Knight does that. He's a justice lawyer. He's very good. And then the two boards are under the GC as well. 
my staff is 15 lawyers. Um, uh, the, I, I, I think I, and I think Craig would second this, I have a very good staff. I'm very careful who I recruit. Um, I have 15 top-notch lawyers. My new, a new lawyer who's starting in February is currently clerking for Chief Judge uh, Michelle of the Federal Circuit, clerk for Chief Judge Robinson on the District of Delaware, and worked at Eli Lilly for four years. And so that's, that's not the typical makeup, but that is somewhat typical of the attorneys in my office. I think about half of us have clerked at the Federal Circuit. Um, I hire people from law firms with several years of experience, you know, mid-level associates, uh, patent examiners, if they have, you know, with, with strong science backgrounds, and mixes of all three or four of those. Um, cases are also staffed in my office with two people, and that provides some diversity on the case. I'll never put two biotech people on a case because maybe they'll know what the brief says, but nobody else will, and including most of the Federal Circuit judges. Um, and Nancy Link, who's my predecessor, des deserves a lot of credit, I think Craig would agree, for changing the dynamic of the office. She really kind of came to it and runs it, and I mean this humbly speaking, a little like the Solicitor General's Office of the United States. She hires people that know the court that they're practicing in front of. She pays, we pay them as much as we can on the government salary. Uh, we want them to work for us for a few years, and then they often go out and do very interesting things. Three major responsibilities. I talk in threes. Someone told me. I think that's because that's what I remember. Um, the litigation side of it, we do all the patent and trademark litigation. Typically, that's when you don't get a patent from the board and you appeal to the Federal Circuit. We defend those cases, about 50 cases a year. We do that on the trademark side as well. We also give a lot of policy advice, and this comes at all shapes and sizes. High-profile cases, these rule packages we spend a lot of time on. Um, the, and you might say, why? And you'd say, well, first of all, we're good writers, so I think we know what we're doing to try to present an issue. And secondly, the rules typically are going to get challenged at some point. And so you want the rules to stand up under litigation, and you can't do everything you want to do. And so we look at it from both a policy perspective of what we want to do and a litigation perspective of what's the district court or ultimately the federal circuit going to say when we get sued and we're standing up there talking to them. So you're, you constantly are thinking of two hats, um, I think, when we do a lot of our work. Uh, we also administer the patent bar. I'm sure none of you violate it, but if you do, uh, my attorneys uh, prosecute those people and typically it results in some sort of suspension or disbarment. Uh, federal court litigation. Um, the appeals to the Federal Circuit are our bread and butter. That's why people come to work for us. Uh, like I said, about 50 a year. Um, you can sue us in district court as well. Most people don't do that. It's under a section called 145. Um, you, uh, it's, it's not certain why people do it. It delays everything. Uh, people try to put in new evidence. Uh, there are rules as to what you can and can't put in, so sometimes that's a bit of a fight. Um, I think people sometimes do it when they haven't prosecuted the case quite as well as they want to. Um, that's the good news for you, but the bad news is we get to put in new evidence too. I assign two lawyers to it, um, and you have to pay our costs. So if we go get an expert, um, which we will, um, you'll typically have to pay for it. So it's a little costly for you and a little uh, time-consuming as well, but it's fine. Uh, they do that on the trademark side as well. We also have cases brought um, in uh, district court under the APA. There are two types of decisions that come out of the patent office. There's there's board decisions, which go to the Federal Circuit, typically. And then there's commissioner's decisions or director's decisions, which are basically deal with petitions, deal with fees, deal with uh, uh, patent term extension. Sometimes they're minor, and sometimes they're really important. Um, and we've had some important ones lately. They have to go through district court and then come up to the Federal Circuit. Um, a word of advice, I, I think it's in a future slide. If you sue us based on our venue, we are not in D.C. anymore. We are in the Eastern District of, of Virginia. If you've been to our offices, we're actually right across the street. So if you want to sue us based on our venue, sue us in the EDVA. It's actually a good place to litigate. They're fast. They're pretty good. They're very good judges. Um, and I think it's beneficial for everybody. Um, again, these are the direct appeals. Um, I'm not sure. Federal Circuit litigation, 50 cases, patent and trademark. Um, the trademark cases are fewer. I think people would typically refile, file a different 
trademark. Um, the cases that go up, though, are usually important on the trademark side. We have a case right now, it's something like the functionality of the Bose 901 speakers. It's pretty important to them, and that's a pretty big case. Uh, trademark cases deal with color. Dot-com cases are now a big deal. So these are some cases that are more precedential in nature. Uh, patent appeals uh, going from lowest to highest. Uh, you know, we get the run-of-the-mill obviousness, anticipation case. Um, we also get pretty complex uh, technical cases. We have a case right now that's up there. Um, one of Mr. Rifen's re-exams is up there. Apparently, he sued a lot of people, I'm told. Uh, we have a case between a company called Translogic and Hitachi um, that resulted in a district court decision of about $100 million. Uh, they found the patent valid and infringed. In the re-exam, we've invalidated the patent. So that $100 million jury verdict is going to be dependent on whether we win or lose our case. It's an important case. And we assign good, you know, the best two people to work on it. So you know, there are cases that are important for legal reasons as long as practical reasons. Uh, and then we have precedential cases, cases that I think will be published. I can't get them all right. I don't predict 100%, but I probably predict about 60 or 70. You know, the patentability of ESTs, yeah, that's an important case. It's a test case. We even tell the court now when it's a test case. We're pretty honest with it. Um, I think judges actually like getting cases that they think they can write about from our venue. I mean, let's face it. One of our appeals is usually pretty focused. It's one or two issues, so it's shorter. And it doesn't involve claim construction. If you're a Federal Circuit judge, you'd say that's at least different and these days. And uh, I think they actually uh, recently have been writing more PTO cases. Because a lot of these issues aren't coming up in district courts anymore. There are, no more tri there are not a lot of trials anymore. And uh, the, you know, the Federal Circuit is spending over half its time doing claim construction. So. Trademark cases, as we said. Here are some examples of the bigger trademark cases. Scandalous marks, uh, phantom marks, uh, dot-com marks are a big deal now. So uh, somebody argued, one guy wanted to argue that um, he had a surname mark, and he said surname should be, he had it, I think, registered in Germany, in Ray Raff. And he said, well, my sur and it, it was almost like a, it wasn't a pro se, but it wasn't a serious litigator going up against us. But his argument was, the Paris Convention is self, is, I forgot that, it was, this was about a year ago, but he argued that because it was registrable in Germany and we were members of the Paris Convention, as was Germany, we had to register his surname in the United States. And it wasn't a crazy argument. I mean, and, and he, he, it, was, it involved international treaty issues and it was a big deal. And had we lost that case, we would have had to register every surname that was ever registered in a foreign country. And so that was an extremely important case. We even used our international people, it's a different office, uh, worked on that case with us. And it wound up in a, in a published opinion by, I think, Judge Dyke with Judge Bryson, I think, either concurring or dissenting. So it was a very important case. District court cases. Um, the, the, the work we do at the, um, uh, there's the, there's the venue, um, the, the district court work we do is less like the typical district court litigation you guys are used to. If it's a commissioner's decision, if it's a decision that that's you disagree with, it usually goes off on motion. Uh, it's fairly respectable how you do it. You set up a briefing schedule. You file first, we file second. You know, so it's almost like an appeal. It's slightly different, but that's typically how the cases work. Appellate litigation, litigation in my office, <laughs> is fairly gentlemanly or gentlewomanly, whatever the correct term would be. Um, there's a bar that you don't know each other, everybody, but you fight about the issues. You don't, I mean, there's no, there's no advantage to gain. You all, all you do is file a couple of briefs and then go to the argument. So you don't have the, you know, you can't jerk the other side around that much and it's not even smart to do it. And the Federal Circuit won't tolerate it either. Um, but now I'm going to talk a little about the uh, Supreme Court work we've been doing. Um, up to a couple of years ago, we would never, there was no, I mean, between 82 and the year 2000, how many patent cases the Supreme Court did? Five, you know, seven, something like that. Very rarely did they take them. I'm told by people at 
that work in front of the Supreme Court. Seth Waxman, the former Solicitor General, said if it had the word patent in it, they weren't going to take it. But now things are starting to change. They're taking more cases. They've taken three cases this year. And they've also been asking the government whether to take a case or not. And I'll talk about that in a minute. But the two questions, I don't argue in front of the Supreme Court, and I don't write the briefs. Um, it is a big government. We are a participant, but we're not the sole participant. I get to argue at the Federal Circuit. You know, we get to write our briefs without DOJ, but when you get to the Supreme Court, uh, it's the Solicitor General's office that represents the agency, that represents the government in court. And, and there are a lot of interests besides the PTO that they consider in the patent area. There are two ways to get into one of these cases. One is a party. That's rare. Rarely do you see a VUS or a VDUDIS case at the Supreme Court. Uh, but as an amicus is where we get in. And at one time, um, uh, I used to try to explain why we would get in. And now I have to say why we don't get in. Because we basically get into every IP case uh, as an amicus now. If they take it. Uh, were involved. The standard was a little bit more subjective before. You know, do we have an interest? Uh, can we say something unique? But I haven't seen that internally be the standard anymore. They take a case, it's important. Let's not screw it up. Let's tell them what we think the right answer is. And at CVSG, I'll explain in a minute. Sometimes they ask what, are, what we think about a case. And when they do that, we always file something. There used to be, I thought, two times to participate in a Supreme Court case. As you, I assume, all know, it's not a matter of right to get to the Supreme Court. There are about 8,000 cert petitions a year. And of that, they only took 80 cases last year. I thought it was always a great job. You could decide how much work you wanted to do next year. Kind of be envious. Um, and there's some quiet criticism that they're not taking enough cases. And Justice, Chief Justice Roberts had indicated, I thought, off his uh, testimony, I saw a little bit that he thought they might be able to take a few more cases, but he reserved judgment until he got there and didn't want to tick off all his colleagues before he even show up, showed up. But So the question is, you petition for cert. You want the court to take the case. Sometimes people will try to get the government to file a brief to say, tell them, the Supreme Court, this is one of those cases they should take. The number of times the government has participated in, an, in a patent case or copyright case or trademark case at the search stage, without being asked, in the last, in my tenure, 10 years, is zero. They've only done it in like seven cases in the last 10 or 15 years. They don't get involved. They don't tell the Supreme Court to take inter-parties cases at the search stage that often. They really save that shit for a big deal case. Now, if the government is the party, different story. You know, if somebody was convicted and then it was reversed. But in the patent area or the copyright area, uh, they don't do it. So if you ask, you can ask, and it actually is not a bad idea to ask because we'll get the briefs, we'll keep an eye on the case, but we won't typically get involved. The, the third bullet point is at the merit stage, we typically now get involved. So you know, when Vesto got taken, we were going to file a brief. When FAF got taken, we filed the brief. Um, uh, Grokster got taken, we filed the brief. But there's this now middle stage, where as at the search stage, after all the briefs are filed, the court asked the Solicitor General, should we take the case? And the government responds to those in a, in a brief um, that is filed. It's called the Cert Views of the Solicitor General, a CVSG. And um, they've used this all for, for a long time, but not in the patent area. And in the last several years, they've been using it a lot more in the patent area. Why? You know, maybe they want to figure out which patent case to take. But, but um, I think they're using it a lot now. Why? Maybe it defers the clerk's work on the case, because that way they don't have to work on the case. It delays, because we have to file a brief. It'll delay the case. It won't get taken until next year. And I'll be off working at a big law firm and making a lot of money. But they do use it. And uh, it's often interesting how um, these uh, uh, briefs get developed. These are some of the cases the Supreme Court um, has been interested in recently. Um, uh, they tend to deal with either big areas of patent law, in my opinion, or areas of law that kind of intersect patent and antitrust, patent and FDA approval. Um, there's some cases right now, up, eBay is up there right now, injunctions. What's the standard for an injunction? Um, LabCorp is kind of a confusing case, but it's 
it may be a one-on-one case. KSR, should there be a motivation standard for obviousness? So the court's very interested in this. Um, why? You know, there's a lot of reasons. I mean, let's face it, the Supreme Court does this in every other area of the law, so why shouldn't they do it here? I think the only reason people are a little uh, interested in this now is because they hadn't done it for a long period of time and now they're just doing it. So maybe it's just getting back to status quo. Federal Circuit's been around for 25 years. Maybe they're like, well, maybe we should relook at what they've been doing. Uh, there are better lawyers uh, that are doing this now. There's a Supreme Court bar that are filing a lot of these briefs. Uh, there are law professors like uh, Professor Nard here who file amicus briefs telling with, with 25 of his professor friends saying, yes, uh, the Federal Circuit is wrong in this case. You should take it. So there's a lot of, motiva there's a lot of uh, different impetuses that are going on. The law clerks now can take patent classes in law school. What a concept. You know, it wasn't true 10, 15, 20 years ago at every school in the country. So there's a lot of things going on. And the, and the judges are just interested. It's a, big, it's a big part of our economy now. It's a bigger asset. So why shouldn't they be interested? Should you get, you know, people ask me, should you get Supreme Court counsel? It's up to you. But if you got sued in Delaware, would you go get local counsel? If you got sued at the ITC, would you go get somebody that knows something about the ITC? Supreme Court's not that much different. There are different rules, different way to write briefs. There are meetings you can have with the Solicitor General of the United States to try to persuade him to side with you on the case if the case gets taken. And people know how to do this. And uh, there's most of the people that are Supreme Court uh, practitioners have argued cases before the Supreme Court. That's not a lot of people. Uh, but you know, I know Jones Day has people. Judge Dyke on the Federal Circuit was a Supreme Court appellate specialist at Jones Day. You know, he's argued, I think, nine cases at the Supreme Court, a lot of appellate cases. So he would be one of these types of people before he joined the court. Um, what cases might they take? Um, you know, I wouldn't be surprised if they revisit whether or not um, claim construction is a question of law or fact. Um, business method patents are getting a lot of criticism. Supreme Court's never said a business method patent is patentable under 101. So these are issues they really haven't talked about. Um, some of the uh, willful infringement issues, uh, if Judge Rader and Judge Lori don't figure out a way to straighten their differences, the written description, the standard might go. I mean, they keep writing these dissents. And that's another reason these cases go, because the Federal Circuit judges have figured out how to tee these things up. Um, and so they're getting good at it. So it's a whole number of dynamics. What's happening too now is if you go look at the law of the Supreme Court, when you cite, let me back up, when you cite Supreme Court, when you write a Supreme Court brief, the only thing you really cite typically are Supreme Court cases, um, treatises, and law review articles. Those are the three main things, and statutes and rules. But that's different than appearing in front of the Federal Circuit. You don't typically cite Supreme Court cases of the Federal Circuit or law review articles or treatises. So it's kind of a different game. And what people are doing is they will discuss why they should win under the current standard by the Federal Circuit, then preserve for waiver purposes a questioning whether or not the standard is right, not whether they win or lose under it, but whether the standard is consistent with Supreme Court case law. And then when they lose on the facts, and the court doesn't even look at the standard, petition for Supreme Court saying the standard the Federal Circuit is using on X is inconsistent with the Supreme Court case law the last time you guys took this case, this issue. And I'll tell you, that's probably true in several areas of law. Why? Because the Supreme Court hasn't taken a case in a long time. And the Federal Circuit case law has evolved. Or the technology wasn't even there. Patentability of ESTs, Supreme Court hasn't talked about that. Business method patents, Supreme Court hasn't talked about that. So, you know, and you go read those old Supreme Court cases, and they can say a lot of things to a lot of people. And so people are now, without the benefit of a Federal Circuit decision, just challenging the standard that the Federal Circuit is using. And, you know, I'm not saying they shouldn't. I'm just saying it's interesting that this is happening. And I think that's what kind of happened in KSR um, and in some of these other things. eBay. You know, eBay, they didn't say to the Federal Circuit, the standard you're applying is wrong. They just said we win or lose under the current standard. Then they go up to the Supreme Court and they say, 
the Federal Circuit isn't applying the right standard for injunction. So there's also better counsel, so there's a lot of reasons. SGS, a lot of people. Uh, it's, these are some of the agencies that get asked. Anybody can participate if they want to. FTC is interested. Antitrust is interested. There's all sorts of aspects of DOJ that are interested. So it's not just us. And depending on the case, an FDA case, the FDA would be interested and things like that. These are some of the meetings. Uh, you can meet with this, the, uh, you can request a meeting with the Solicitor General. It's a big meeting, usually. Uh, agency counsel is there from all the respective agencies. You get to pitch why you think in a CVSG context or a merits context, the government should file a brief on your side. And it's a very interesting meeting. Um, you will be not cross-examined, but people will ask you a lot of questions. You leave the room. The next party comes in for an hour. They leave the room. And then the government kind of discusses what they want to do. So it's, it's very engaging. Um, if we get into, as an amicus, PTO has a lot of flexibility to file briefs at the, at the Federal Circuit. But if we ever get in as an amicus, we need the Solicitor General of the United States to approve it. So in Phillips, we were able to file an amicus brief. Um, but we had to get SG approval, and I was lucky enough to get to argue that case. Um, I think if we asked for it, we filed one in the Voda case where the district court judge said it was okay to have U.S. cases, U.S. patent cases involving Japanese <coughs> patents and Canadian patents. The problem with this is I need to know about the case. If it's on banc, it's easy. I know about it. Um, and in fact, in Phillips, the court even asked. So if they ask, it's even easier. Um, if it's one of your cases and it's a facts case, we're not going to be interested. But if it involves a major area of law and you want to send me a copy of the brief uh, or the lower court decision or tell me what you're going to argue, I'll listen. It takes a long time to get through the approval process, but I'll at least listen. I mean, we don't want to do this 10 times a year, but doing it once or twice a year is not crazy. These are just some of the other... Uh, aspects of doing that. We get involved in interference cases more often because the two parties are actually the two parties in the case, but sometimes it involves an interference rule, and so we'll file an amicus brief. Um, the other major thing I want to talk a little bit about is the PTO rules. We do a lot of legal advice. We advise on all sorts of things, big, big re-exams, big applications, um, you know, legal decisions that are made in the agency. I mean, for good or for bad, a lot of the examiners are not lawyers. And so they come talk to us about what they can and can't do, not in a given case typically, but in a series of cases or, or in a, you know, a whole bunch. What should they do with this problem? How should they decide this petition? You know? uh, but what we've been doing lately has been to do uh, with the rules. Um, uh, and how many people here are familiar with the rules we put out in January for continuation and claims? Show of hands. Not too many. I'm surprised. Well, you may want to look, because the two things we're thinking of doing are to limit continuations to one as a matter of right. And then you're going to have to petition and explain why you want a second or a third or a fourth one. The second thing is, regardless of how many claims you file, we're only going to look at 10 to start as representative claims, just like courts do. And then before we issue any, we'll look at them all. We'll look at all the ones before we issue them. But basically, we're going to focus on 10. And the third thing, which we haven't done yet, so you can save any criticism of this one until we do it, is we're thinking of if you submit a lot of, re if you, at a certain point when you submit references, not at the beginning, we're going to make you start talking about them. You know, not when you submit five or 10, but if you submit more than 25, we're going to make you start talking about them. And um, the, the thought behind this, these three packages, was 90 to 95% of the people practice in a reasonable way. 95% of the people only file one continuation, have fewer than 50 claims, um, file less than 25 references. But the 5 or 10% that don't really seem to screw up the rest of the process. I, I think it's also not good for litigation to have five continuations. They just keep an application in the system, and it doesn't give certainty to the public. And so the thought is to try to give more of a template-like focused 
um, examination. So the numbers um, are pretty are getting bigger. These numbers are small. We had over 400,000. These are last year's numbers. We had this year we had over 400,000 applications. Okay, we don't need any more. We have enough. And it's just, it's just going up like this. And I think they've got to try to figure out some ways to make people file good applications and ones they've reviewed uh, and ones they really care about uh, and ones they want relatively soon. So this isn't going to do all that, but this is at least a small step in the right direction. Of those 300,000, over 100,000 were continuations. I mean, that's rework. That's the second application. And so the thought was, OK, maybe not at the first one where we're going to stop them, but at the second one, we're going to at least make you explain why you need to do this. I mean, let's face it. People file foreign translations without doing anything else to them. That's unacceptable. You do that now, it's going to cost you one byte. You, know, you have to think about what you're filing before you file it. That's not to say you can get it done in two actions, but uh, at least at some point, we're going to have to have closure to the system as opposed to leaving it open throughout the life of the patent. I know people want to do it for interference reasons. I know people want to do it for doctrine of equivalence reasons. I know there are trade-offs, but this is the thought process that we put into this. Um, here are the limits for the second and subsequent continuation. There's the standard. Why is needed to obtain, um, why you couldn't have done it before, basically. And I think there should be comments as to what this standard should mean or examples. We didn't do that yet. You know, if you're in the FDA and they're doing tests and you've got new evidence that you didn't have before, that seems fair. The examiner cited a new reference that you didn't know about before and you need to file an amendment, that seems to me to be fair. It's kind of like being in court. It's due process. But if I just want to keep one in the system because I want to watch what my competitors do, that's not fair. We wouldn't grant that. There will be no more first action finals. So apparently, I guess, examiners could go final immediately. That won't happen. So you'll get four bites of the apple in total. And if you think you want to file, well, what happens if I file five applications on the same day? They count as one if they have similar uh, claim, similar inventors, similar specs, similar dates. So we're just going to treat them as one. This is the, that point. Um, you know, how will we decide this? I'm sure there'll be people will try to game it. There'll be some subjectivity to it. But we'll try to say, look, if you basically just file a whole bunch of applications on the same day, um, it's not really your right to do that. Um, so we're going to assume there's a double patenting rejection. And you explain to us why there shouldn't be. You chose to file them separately. You think they're separate. Just tell us why. You know, one's a product, one's a process. OK. There are two different classes. OK but you're going to have to explain why. Why are they patently distinct? Representative claims. We actually thought about capping claims at 50, because that was, again, the 95%. 95% of the people had 50 or fewer claims, so why not just cap it at 50? The thought was, and that's not st still off the table, but the thought was, after some discussions of how other people do this, was to use representative claims. That's what the board does. That's what courts do. That's what everybody else does. Let's face it, you get 100 claims in front of an examiner. He can't do it. Put yourself in the shoes of an examiner. You just can't do it. Give him 10. He should be able to do a good job. And this is clearly, somebody said, when this came out, they said, well, it seems like you're trying to shift some of the burden on the applicants. I thought, you know, when the blogs were going, there's a lot of chatter in emails about this I've seen on web pages. People have sent it to me. I said, well, what are they saying? And they said, well, they're saying that you're trying to make applicants do more work on their end before they file. It's like, well, that's accurate. That's, exact, that's what we're trying to do. I said, that's not inaccurate. Um, but you know, I, I assure you, I am not a numbers guy. I use the numbers just to give you some sense. This is not going to solve the backlog problem. This is not going to solve their problem. This is going to, you know, you go to district, there are analogies here. If you go to the district court and you want to litigate 50 claims, you can't. Pick five. I know you want to use 50, but you can't pick five. What do they say? 99% you know, of the work gets done in 75% of the time. That's what we're trying to do. It's not exactly the way it was, but we're not trying to cut you <laughs> off the knees. I mean, we could have stopped continuations at one. 
We may change representative claims to 15 if we get a good reason why. There are, these are proposed rules, they're not definite. But if you go to the Supreme Court, you get 50 pages. Okay, you could be executed soon, you could be the President of the United States, you get 50 pages. You know, it's not unlimited process, it's due process. And we're just trying to put reasonable limits on what we think should be fair in a system that seems to be followed by most people that will let people do a better job on both ends. If you want more claims examined than 10, you can, but you're going to have to do work. You're going to have to put in basically a patentability report. You're going to have to explain a lot of stuff. You're going to have to do a search. You're going to have to explain why the claims are, um, how they're relevant. There's, going to be, there's a whole section of the, of the rules that my guess is people won't want to do given the current inequitable conduct standard. So they'll let us examine 10 claims. And this is just some more things. Um, whenever we issue claims, they will have been examined. So if you get an independent, we'll examine then before we issue them the dependent claims that follow. Um, and again, there's the immediate examination. If you do the more work, we'll look at them all. Uh, these, are the, these are where you can find the rules, the effective date. Oh, the, the effective dates. Um, we're not going to have a GATT bubble. We've already done that once. We're not doing that again. So the way the claims are going to work, as I understand it, I haven't really thought this through, but the way the claims are going to work is, is if you've already got an application on file, which a lot of you will have, it's going to apply to them, but everybody gets to amend their claims free and then pick the 10 claims they want. And then on continuation, it's going to be your next application, whatever it is, continuation, RCE, or new, you're only going to get one more continuation from that. I don't exactly know whether that means you get two more of a current application. I'll have to think about that. I'm not, when I saw this slide written up, I hadn't asked one of the lawyers I worked with on, on this particular point. But we'll know, I'll know that if you send me an email. I, I'm just not sure. I'm sure, I think the rules are pretty clear on that. Um, the last one, these things get out at the same time. They're a little more complex, or not, not complex. They require one more set of clearance. Um, these are not in stone yet. I mean, these haven't even been proposed, so just because I say this is what I think they're going to look like doesn't mean this is what they were. But uh, again, this won't have effect on 95% of the applications, anybody who files less than 25 references. But the th my thought, at least, and I'll say this for myself, but you know, I think it makes a lot of sense. Um, there's different ways to do this, but one of the thoughts I had was, look, have a discussion requirement. You're going to have to explain why it is relevant, why you give me this reference. Not, and, and, and things won't count. There's a lot of things that won't count. Foreign search reports don't count. Um, but you know, basically, if you give me a reference that you found and you want to give it to us, if it's 25 or less, you don't have to say anything. It gets past 25, you have to say something to all of them. So that's going to mean people will probably give us 25. If the reference is over 30 pages of relevancy, and you don't point it out, you're going to have to start talking. And then the thought is at a certain point in time in the examination, you can't sandbag us. One thought I have is after the first office action, anything you give us after that, you're going to have to talk about it. Um, not a lot, but you're going to have to say something. I mean, let's face it. You go to the Federal Circuit, you don't hand them 25 references or 25 cases and say, I win. You don't give them a table of authorities. You explain why um, it is relevant. Now, I know the inequitable conduct standard is really under a lot of criticism, and I think it's a little crazy. My personal view is get rid of inequitable conduct and willfulness. Okay? Think about it. They're overpled, rarely proven. They screw up all sorts of stuff. You have to get opinions. You break attorney-client privilege. They're really messy, but they really you know, screw up the other side. And one's used by the plaintiff, and one's used by the defendant. So maybe we should just, I mean, in theory, they make a lot of sense. But in practice, they don't seem to be working. My guess is they wouldn't throw them out. They'd probably just raise the standard to like a Rule 11 standard or an egregiousness standard. Let's face it, we file briefs all the time. We don't worry about what we say. At the patent office, we don't say anything. It's not working. People don't read references. People don't want to say anything about a reference. It's not working. So I think if these do go out, we would be sympathetic 
to a proposed change also either to Rule 56, which the court, Federal Circuit doesn't limit itself to anyway, or the law on inequitable conduct. So these will not be jammed down everybody's throat, but at least we'll start the debate. The last thing I do is office enrollment discipline. If you have a complaint against another lawyer, sometimes law firms file these. People that leave, um, co-counsel. I mean, small stuff, I don't, we don't try to go after. There's a person who does this, our head of OED, Harry Motes. Um, he, uh, uh, he does a pretty good job. But basically, if we file a complaint, you know, if you screw up your letterhead, we're not disbarring you. We'll send you a letter of reprimand quietly and say, fix it. Small stuff is not a big deal. If you're one of these invention development companies that's on at like 4 o'clock in the morning that's fleecing people, maybe there are some that aren't, but if you're, if you're a lawyer involved with that, yeah, we'll, we'll get you kicked out. And the guy who runs this in my office, he's also a patent lawyer, but he, he's a former DA from Florida, and so he's pretty good and he knows what he's doing. Uh, and they're tried in front of ALJs. I think we use ALJs from EPA. Um, and you know, we typically you know, win. We'll settle, too. I mean, we're not looking to beat people up. With the exam also we do. The exam is now electronic, right? You can take the exam once a month now. Anybody take it electronically? New law student? Yeah. Is it good? It's got some kinks to be worked out. If you fail, you go take it the next month, the next month. It's got to be a lot easier logistically than before. The last thing is there's a bunch of OED rules floating around. A package went out about a year ago, a year and a half ago. They were too complicated. They weren't great. I didn't work on them, but that's not a disclaimer. Um, we've put out the first, we divided it into threes. We put out the first set. They're already out, so now the exam is working for people that want to get in. The second one is going to be about process. The third one's going to be about ethics, and it's basically going to adopt the model rules and the model code, whichever one most of the states have. So they're not, in, they're not really intended to change things. They just haven't been updated in a long, long time. They're just trying to improve it. Uh, put some teeth into things, should have teeth put into them. And so they're not meant to be a CJ. When they went out the last time, they were too big. <laughs> they said you could only get 90 days to comment, which was silly. Um, the, the other rules that were up there, May is our final deadline right now. It may move. We don't fear we'll implement these until next year. They're big deals, and we want people to give constructive comments. If your suggestions are don't change anything, that's not a great comment. If you think of something we haven't thought of or want to, put some, want to give some analysis as to how it will, you know, if you say, well, I want to do this because I want to keep my application on file for as long as I can because of DOE, I don't think that's a great comment. If it's in the biotech area, 15, we can't stop at 10 claims for the following reasons, and here are three examples, that's a good comment. And we wrote these. We're not experts. I've got people in my office that worked on these that have prosecuted cases from the outside, um, uh, litigated them, as well as patent examiners. So my office really tries, to the extent we can, come in with some outsider's perspective of what's fair and what's not fair. But they're not perfect. And so that's it. It's a good job. I like what I do. What's a better way to do it? I think that needs to be disclosed. <laughs> What's a better way to do it? If you make an addition on the record saying, yeah, this is my claim, doesn't that kind of put you in the corner when it comes to litigation? Instead, the better way might be to when they file a report of claim. You know, we didn't go out and say, which one would you prefer? But as I said, we initially thought about limiting it to a number of claims. Um, it's also a question of which one would be subject to more of a legal challenge. I don't know if the reason we didn't do the other one was because of that. And if it was, I probably wouldn't tell you. But, you know, if people would rather have a hard limit, I think we would consider that it gets the same result. We thought that that would not be the preferable way or would be a bit more arbitrary um, in some ways. Um, I haven't really heard a lot of discussion by people that they think that's better or not, but 
you know, people are out on the road right now talking about these rules, and I'm going to be doing it a little bit. And so um, I think, I don't think it's so much an admission. I think if you just say, look, when you say here's my representative claim, I mean, people do it now anyway. They do it at the board. They do it in litigation. So we didn't see that as an admission against interest that could really cut against you. It didn't say it was your most important claim. It didn't say that it was the claim that somebody was infringing. It just said here's a representative claim that you could examine. Well, I can talk only so much about that case. The Supreme Court cert petition was denied. Uh, the issue was kind of interesting. When BlackBerry, if you send a BlackBerry, if I send one to you, if I send a message to you, it bounces. It actually goes through Canada. And their argument was that you don't infringe in the United States. And I, I mentioned this earlier today. So when I got to meet with those guys, they wanted us involved in the en banc stage. And so we met with them, and we talked to them, and I was talking to them. And they said, I said, what happens if we have a patent, Canadian patent, same law, same patent, do you infringe in Canada? And he said, well, I'd rather not answer that question. I said, too bad. And he said, no. So I said, you really think we should have a patent system where Congress really wanted a patent system where you don't infringe anywhere just by taking systems and putting them in different countries? So that issue never got taken. And the Federal Circuit said no for product and seems to have said yes for process, although I'm not so sure why they did that. Um, the big issue now is the injunction. Everybody's afraid the Blackbirds are going to get enjoined. I'll believe it when I see it. Um, the government won't be enjoined, but I don't think the government's going to be happy if I can't send you an email or somebody else. The government can't get enjoined for other reasons. Uh, the injunction standard is right now up at the Supreme Court in eBay. So I would think if BlackBerry's smart, they would try to get the district court to stay any injunction pending the Supreme Court deciding their case, which they're going to do by June or July. So, I mean, it's a lot of negotiation tactics. And we will set forth our position in eBay probably in the next couple of weeks because I think the government will follow brief. Wasn't the PTO reviewing the, the PTP claims? Yes, the so PTO. The PTO, and this is public. Uh, there's a bunch of re-exams. Um, it's, it's not final yet but it likely will be final from the examiner's standpoint in the next month or two. In fact, the office action that went out the last time said you should expect that the next office action will be a final action. Um, there's been a lot of back and forth. To be fair, the PTO probably wasn't as expeditious on this case as it should have been. It is now. One good thing I can tell you is how many of you have ever filed a re-exam? Yeah. Are you scared to file re-exams? Yeah, you should have been. Um, we, sh we weren't doing as good a job as we should have been. I will tell you, it has gotten better. And I don't say that lightly. I'm, a, I'm not a used car salesman. They have formed a super group for re-exam. It's about 20 or 30 examiners. I think they're paid well. Half of them are lawyers. They're top-notch people. They consult with us about once every couple weeks on cases. They will... They said they'll get everything done in a year. That's silly. You shouldn't commit to that. They will try to get everything done in a year. And I think they will get 95% of the cases done in a year. So some of these older cases that were kind of a bit unwieldy um, have gotten messy, and now they're getting cleaned up. It takes, only a, it takes a certain amount of time to fix it. But then they'll get to appeal to the board, and then they'll get to go to the federal circuit. So it's not over. Um, but um, the PTO has rejected those claims based on a Norwegian reference, I'm told, that was not in the litigation. I personally don't think the case was litigated probably as well as it could have been, but that's a different story. So, <laughs> anything else? Yeah, Regarding the uh, continuation rule changes, what impact do you foresee that having on the, uh, the burden on the Board of Appeals? It's going to go up. Um, we, we're estimating numbers. If you figure there's 30,000 continuations, second and more, that aren't going to get filed. I guess we could have 30,000 more appeals. I don't think that's going to happen. Um, but, you know, we think there'll be a couple thousand more, you know, another thousand appeals. Or I don't know. I mean, we're, Mike Fleming, the new board judge, has done some estimates. But what's going to happen is one reason no one wa that's a good point. We're not saying you're done after the first continuation. We're just saying file an appeal. And part of what that does is it takes it out of this infinite loop between the applicant and the examiner. 
And right now, it will go to an, a pre-appeal brief conference. You don't even have to file a brief and three people look at your case. Then you file a brief and three people look at your case. And then if they still think it's a good rejection, the board looks, three of the board judges look at your case. And then eventually three federal circuit judges. So part of what this is doing is at least stopping this wrangling back and forth between the applicant and the examiner. And I'm told, and this is a scary number, that our pre and post appeal brief reversals of the examiner's rejection is like 40%, 50%. So rather than getting caught up with this examiner, you know, his SPI or his director or whoever is on these conferences says, no, your rejection is wrong, the applicant's right. So it will, in some cases, move the ball faster. And the last point is, a lot, one reason a friend of mine said the reason he doesn't want to go to the board is because it takes too long. The average appeal from briefing to decision, from being assigned to the board, fully briefed, like the Federal Circuit, not in the clerk's office, but sitting at a judge's desk, and a decision is six months. Six months. I think the electrical is higher, but six months. Now, you guys have like 14 or 16 months to brief these stupid things. And that should change. You can buy three more months, buy three more months. You don't get to do that even at the Federal Circuit. And the examiner doesn't have to do it. You know. So part of it is to say, look, let's brief it in four months or six months at most and then decide it in six months. So you'll get a decision. You'll get to go through the appeal brief, pre-appeal, post-appeal, and board decision, let's say within a year. That's better than the Federal Circuit. But the point is to move the ball somewhere, to reach closure, to move on. And it's, it doesn't, it's not perfect, but if you think just keep going and going and going and going and going. One suggestion I've had, based on some comments, some people I know that do really good prosecution, I trust their work, have told me is there should be a way to get at the examiner at the first office action. And apparently you can call the director, but people don't like to do that because they take off the examiner. But there should be some objective way, maybe, you guys pay some money and say, look, this examiner is off base. It's not balls and strikes. Like, he's saying there are five balls to a walk, and it's just wrong. And there are times when that happens, and it seems better to catch that sooner rather than later. At least we're trying to do it somewhat sooner at the first continuation. Anybody else? You'll make more money. Yeah, I, I think there will be a deterrent effect. I, I do. I mean, it's going to cost more. You can't just give it to the translator and file. And I'm not saying everybody does that. But you're going to have to have somebody actually rewrite it. You're going to have to pick which 10 claims. You're going to realize you only get four bytes. So you can't fix this later. I can't just file a continuation and worry about it later. So yeah, there is the quality is hopefully up front will be better because it's going to cost you if it's not. And that's going to result in, in the higher costs. But the, some of the big filers are okay with this. Now, I'm not saying that makes it right. But like IBM is cool with this, Micron is cool with this. These are the big two or three, five. Now, they also bulk file. Well, not bulk file. That's a bad word. They file a lot. You know, you wonder why they want to be famous for having the most patents. I think you want to be famous for having a few good ones, but, but it's going to affect them. And the bulk filers, this is really going to affect. I mean, if it was up to me, and it's not, they haven't made me the director, I'd like double the fees. It's too cheap to file a patent application. I'm really sorry. It's just not a deterrent. You want people to file better good ones and think about it before they file, not file them like they're chits. And I'd pay examiners more money, and I'd get people that are lawyers to be examiners, at least a third to whatever it would be, and I'd give them more time. You want to improve the quality, that's how we improve the quality. But until that's not going to happen tomorrow, getting fees changed is a congressional issue, it's, it takes a lot of work, and I'm not even sure my agency wants to do that, so I don't mean to speak out of turn. But this is at least, I mean, this is fair. Do you think if I went to Senator Hatch and said, do you know that people can file patent applications at the 19th year? And just keep going and tell me what their invention is 19 years after they filed. What do you think he'd say? Come on. 
Do you think you don't you go to district court and you lose? What happens next? You appeal. We're gonna let you go again, but not five times. And then representative claims, I think that's really simple. It's look, you give us a hundred, fine. We're gonna look at the which ten do you want us to look at first? I mean that's more of a procedural issue than than even uh, cutting you off. But it will cost more. And you know, given what's the cost of a patent application as compared to the attorney's fees to file it? What's the percentage? Twenty percent? Yes? No? What do they say? It's like 10K, so 2K maybe are fees. Maybe we should make that a little more even. But at least you'll have to do more work, I think, up front. I think we accept that. So. There's a uh, reception following 